Hello there and welcome to What's the Point? A question we should all be asking ourselves and the podcast by brand architect Bill Ellis that will help you discover, clarify and live your purpose. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of What's the Point? And I've been blessed with some tremendous guests in in my tenure of doing this podcast, and today is certainly no exception. Um, I am really thrilled to have Dr. Russell Lede as my guest. Thank you so much for having me on today, uh, Bill. I'm super excited. It's, it's a to be pleasure, and, and, um, and I've been uh, told that my best way to refer to him is as RJ. Yep. Uh, so that's that's what I will do. Um, if I were to take the time to tell you all of the the um, accomplishments of of this still very young man, it would take me forever. So I'm going to do something I haven't done before, and and that is. I'm going to read a quote from from RJ, Dr. Lede, and I think it sets up very nicely his story. And so very simply, it says, this world isn't going to hand anything to you. You've got to get it. Yep. And the other part of that is time is a non-refundable resource. Yep. Brilliant. Uh, uh, Tell us more about that, please. Yeah, I I think... uh... When I look back over my life, especially maybe the last 10 to 15 years, those those two things have have permeated every uh, ounce of my time. It's been um, no one's going to hand you anything. No one is going to hand you anything like if you're waiting, it's not going to happen and you're wasting time. And the other thing is that like today is all you have like you, you tomorrow's not guaranteed um all you have are the moments that you have right now and i've used those to the best of my ability i've exhausted every ounce of energy i had and i've emptied the tank for like 13 years straight just emptied it every day for 13 years straight and kept my head down and before i knew it i was i was where i am today and i'm really grateful for that time and i think this period of my life now will be about recovering from that well that again that that's that says a whole lot but let let me help the listeners understand a little bit more of when you say you've emptied the tank for the past uh 13 or or 14 years uh following dr russell j lede comma follows md (laughs) phd and mba (laughs) Uh, what also is in there that you, I don't think you get the, uh, the the letters at the end of your name for is U.S. Navy veteran. Yep. And what else is in there, which is maybe the thing that I, I believe is one of your okay. your greatest loves, is being a husband and a father yep. to two young girls. Yeah. You've been busy. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been busy, man. You know, uh, when I... I think it was 2004, I left uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana to go to the United States Navy. The, my only thing on my mind was, one, I wanted to serve my country. Like I really had a a desire to serve my country. Um, I felt like I, I, like I needed to do that. Um, I felt like I personally needed to do that. But the other thing was, is that like, I was like, I think this is a way out. Like this is a way out of poverty. Um, this is a way out of, um, you know, some of the situations I was in back at home and a lack of money, a, a lack of foresight, um, a lack of insight, like a, a lack of um, guidance. And so I went to the military, which was, I think, the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. Um, easy. And then I think what the military did was is that it gave me a mental springboard as well as a physical springboard. So obviously you get paid in the military. Um, and I was able to use that money to, you know, buy an investment property and start thinking about like, how do I allow my money to grow for me, even when I'm sleeping. But the other thing it did was that it surrounded me with some extremely successful people. Um, my first duty station was in Washington, DC at the ceremonial guard, which is, uh, the people that you generally see when the president gets off of Marine one or air force one, people are just standing there. But there's downtime. 
you know, when you get to sit down and talk to these people um, at great lengths. And the thing I would learn from them was, is that don't ever ask anyone for permission. Because people's response to you asking for their permission is based on their thoughts of what you're capable of doing, not your mm-hmm. thoughts of what you're capable of doing. So don't ask people for, for permission. Just ask people for forgiveness um, and just keep it rolling. And so I, that was one of the first pieces of advice that I was given by Master Chief Carolina, who ended up retiring from the United States Navy, I think, after like 31 years. Um, and, you know, the other thing you told me was that the only thing you'll be able to do is what you're willing to do. Um, you're not you aren't able to do things that you just think about. You have to be willing to do them. Like you have to be willing to, to put in the work to do them. And so well, however much amount of work you're willing to put in, that's what you'll be able to do. So there's really no limit. The only limit is what, you're, you, what you decide you're willing to do. And so I just like, oh, I'm not gonna have any limits. But to your point, Bill, I've been with my wife since I was in high school. So I've had someone who's been like a champion right next to me, uh-huh. running this race with me for, we we're, we make 16 years this year. So, wow. you know, I've been with the same person for forever. And that means that I have somebody next to me who isn't figuring out what I'm trying to do. We're figuring out what I'm trying to do together. Um, and so, you know, obviously we, we've raised, we were raising two beautiful girls and, and that's really made me a well-rounded person. Um, not just from a career perspective, but just from a humanity perspective, raising those girls has made me a more patient person um a more insightful person um, a, a more reflective person wow so so rj there is so much in what you've just said uh, i'm gonna have to go back and listen to it and people uh listening now whether they're uh working out or driving or whatever they're doing i'm sure we'll have to go back and and replay this section because there's so much in there and i'm gonna do the best i can to try to unpack some of that Let me start with uh, some of your background, because uh, as impressive as your accomplishments are, um, they become even more impressive in my view when uh, when I learned about your childhood. So you were born, Mm -hmm. I believe, in Gretna, which is on the West Bank of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Then your mother moved to Lake Charles. Tell us some about your childhood and and coming up. You kind of referenced that, but give us some more some more detail. Yeah. So uh, actually, I was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, Okay. And uh, my mom was amazing. You know, my mom was my rock when I was growing up. My mama was the person who I could talk to, you know, uh, she helped me to have a lot of frame on life, uh, but it was rough. You know, that's the the good and bad of it. And my, I think I always say this, my mama would was the type of person who knew how to turn lemons into lemonade and lemon pie uh, <laughs> for, for me and my sister. And so, you know, she, she one of the things that I, I, I'll never forget is my mama understood that I love to read. Like reading is my favorite thing in the world to do. Um, okay. And what that meant was, is that because we couldn't afford to like go to Books A Million or, you know, wherever to get a book. And so she was a certified nurse's aide and she would bring me books home um, from the from the residential home. And I would read those books, man. And I always think back to like, man, my mom was willing to do whatever it took to make sure that I was learning, you know? Um, and I say that gracefully because I don't, I can't understand what it was like for her raising us. I don't know what that felt like. Um, you know, we were, there was a point when we were digging in a dumpster behind Sam's club for dinner. Um, and I'll never forget those days. And I actually am appreciative of those days because they give me a different sense of humanity when I'm dealing with my patients. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I not only know what social determinants of health look like, but I've lived through those, you know, I, I've lived through those. Um, and I understand when a patient is like, look, I, all I had was a corn dog for breakfast. Mm. I understand what that means. Like, you know, I, I understand where that, where they come from when they say that. And so to that point, man, 
my my mom was uh she was just amazing man um and i always try to give her flowers when i can and as i got older you know i think what happened was is that i was like okay i gotta go figure out what kind of life do i want to live like what i only have so many days on earth what do i want to do with this one life that i have and what I decided was is that one, I wanted to explore the world. I wanted to see more than just where I was from. Um, my mom really couldn't afford for us to travel and stuff like that. Um, and so I wanted to see the world. I wanted to do that. Um, but I also wanted to learn from different places. Like I felt like people had different approaches to getting things done that were very different from the small town I came from. Um, and that's that's been true. I've learned from people who are from Idaho, North Dakota, Wyoming, because you meet people from everywhere mm -hmm. in this line of work that I'm in, from France, from Nepal. One of my closest friends is from Nepal, and I never thought I'd ever meet anyone from Nepal, you know, Antarctica, Iceland. Um, and it's just given me a worldview and also a world approach to life, not just, oh, the only way to do it is the American way. Um, there's there's Icelandic ways of doing things that are that are much more superior in certain aspects. You know, there there are Chinese ways that are incredibly different from American ways that might just save you a ton of time and energy and effort and money. So I've just tried to be open to learning. Well, I mean, I, I knew this was going to be a heck of a, a good, fun, rich uh, conversation, but it, but so far it's even more than I could have anticipated. So so much uh, amazing information there, and uh, we we could probably uh, could probably make this three or four episodes, uh, but I'll try not to go that long. Um, yeah, I, so your your quest for learning is impressive your openness to realizing that there are ways other than the way that I've learned mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we discount the way we've learned. It just means there are ways that we can improve what we know or, or, or change what we know. And being open is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's worth the, the time of this episode right there. Just mm -hmm. reiterating that uh, quickly, let me ask you, you said when you ended up uh, enlisting in the Navy, that you felt you wanted to serve your country and that you had to serve your country. And you talked some about the personal benefits that you got as a result. Uh, but what was what was it driving you to when you said you felt you had to serve your country? I think it came from, at least for me, from a sense of um, establishment. Like it was like, OK, I need to establish myself as a person. Like I need, I need to have something that uh, is bigger than me that I can participate in, that will go forth ahead of me to be like a representation of what kind of quality person I am. So you know, I felt like I looked at the way that people responded to people who had served this country, um, and the not only the way they looked at them, but the way they talked about them. I was like, oh, like that seems like the kind of characteristics that I have. Like I'm very dependable. I'm very, I'm always on time. Um, if I say I'm gonna be somewhere, I'm gonna be there. Um, you know, if if I'm doing something, I'm gonna do it 110%. If we're exhausted and we need to keep working, well, we just need to keep working. Like that's just, you know, there's no, there's no quitting. And I felt like that was a group that I belonged to. You know, like I, I, I felt like I had a, a an identity there. So with that, serving this country was uh, a good place for me to start. That was the other thing. It was a good starting point. OK, um, yeah, I had met a recruiter. Um, and he just he and I were playing basketball together back when I was still in high school. And he would always tell me, like, man, listen, you don't have to stay in the military for 20, 30 years. You don't. He was like, but it's a good starting point. Like, it's a good place to help you to organize how to approach life. You become more organized. You become more dependable. You become more self-sufficient. Um, you, you become more independent. You understand how to think on your own, how to make decisions, how to calculate risk management. 
Um, and you also understand how to work in a team. So much of this world now is team based. Like no one person, there are a bunch of experts sitting at a table to figure something out, as opposed to, it used to be just like one or two people sit in a room and figure the whole thing out. Um, but now you have people who concentrate in different areas, just like we do in medicine, right? Like medicine is almost exclusively team-based at this point. Um, and it's worked out really well because having those skills of learning how to lead um, as a teammate, being a teammate and being a leader at the same time is priceless. You can go anywhere if you know how to be a teammate, but you also know how to be a leader. You know how to make decisions and, and rationalize those decisions, justify those decisions, and just keep moving forward. Um, and you have a certain level of confidence in the decisions you make because you, you know how to calculate risk management. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, just it just made going to the military just make so much sense, man. And I think the other thing, too, was just the sense of, um, I, like, I want to feel like I've given something to this country so that if I get older and I need something back, I have something up, I have something stored up. So, you know, I have healthcare for the rest of my life. Like there's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, I also have financial help for the rest of my life. So those two things are priceless because most the two two of the most expensive things are healthcare and um, and money management. So, uh, yeah, you know, I paid the price and, and now now I'm reaping the benefits. Yeah, and then the other thing that's that's amazing. The other thing that is um, true out of that is you now for the rest of your life have that experience, that discipline, those lessons, the insights of being uh, both a team member and a team leader. Um, so with all of your credentials, uh, MD, PhD, MBA, I, I will predict this. You will also, uh, in, in the not too distant future, be able to add New York Times bestselling author <laughs> and keynote speaker <laughs> to, to your list of credentials. I have no doubt about that. Um, so speaking, speaking of your credentials, I mean, so many people would be thrilled to get one of those, much less three of those the little letters behind your name. And, you know, so the MBA um, is is impressive. The MD we'll talk about in just a minute. But but the PhD, what I wanted, what I want the listeners to understand is, you know, people might think PhD is just an academic thing, but you have a your doctorate in molecular oncology and uh, tumor immunology. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, and, and that's from New York University. So, so you've been to Southern University. You've been in New York University. Try to put all this in some type of perspective for us. Or from five years in, in the Navy to now, uh, as of just within the past few weeks, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, 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 degreed uh, medical doctor. Yeah. Um, that's hard to do, Bill, man, because you know, <laughs> I know it is. That's why I'm asking you to do it. <laughs> you know, I think it's if I'm honest, um, I'm still reeling. Um, this is the first time I have another about two weeks off before I start residency. And um, this is the first time I've been able to reflect, man, and since I started. I did five years active duty, another four and a half years in the reserves um, while also going to college. And as soon as I fin I finished college, May 15, 2009. No, I'm sorry, 2013. I started at NYU School of Medicine June 1st. Mm. So two weeks later, I started at NYU. I finished at NYU May 19th, 2018 and started at Tulane University June 1st. Mm. So realistically, I've never had more than two weeks off since August 1st of 2009. So I've been going straight and I haven't really had time to reflect. I've never really had time to reflect. And now I have this time to sit back and it, it, it like literally dawned on me last night. I was at dinner and I was like, wow, I'm actually a medical doctor. Like, but I'm also actually a scientist. 
And I'm also actually a businessman. Like I'm, I, I'm actually all these things that I've been working yeah. so hard to be. Now I can breathe. Like I actually did it. Stop. Take a second. Pat yourself on the back. Breathe. Um, NYU was whew, NYU was the greatest and hardest, most challenging experience I've ever had, because New York is a different beast. <laughs> Yeah. New, York, New York is a different beast. You know, Alicia Keys said, if you can make it in, in New York, you can make it anywhere, um, mm -hmm. which is which is true, because I think had I not gone to New York, I wouldn't have been able to um, do the MD MBA at Tulane. I would not have been able to because w what what New York did was just force me to be a lion, like just an untamed lion, just go and ravage everything that I want at at like the expense of anything. Just go get it because no one's going to hand it to you um, and no one's looking to offer it to you. So, you know, my time in New York, I was super successful. I was able to be funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the National Institutes of Health, the Ford Foundation. Um, we published in really high impact journals. Um, and we did some amazing science, but I also was able to do community advocacy work um, through this program that I co-founded with one of my friends, Dr. Julia Dirk, called Clear Direction Mentoring, where we took kids from some of the lowest performing high schools in New York and brought them to NYU School of Medicine to see what science up close looked like. So I was able to do all the things that I really wanted to do in New York City, but it it was like really hard to do because New yeah, let, let me interrupt you just for a very quick second. My apologies, but I, I, I don't want this to get lost in the middle of what you were doing, which is your words, ravaging everything you wanted. You were still cognizant of giving back. Mm -hmm. You were still cognizant of helping others. And when you when you brought those uh, those high school students and from very uh, uh, difficult situations in their high school to see that there's another opportunity, that's enormous. And that's something you don't get a credential behind your name for. That's something that you get a check mark on your heart yeah. um, and and just knowing what that you've added to humanity. So I, I just wanted to make sure that was a critical point and didn't get overlooked. Again, uh, go ahead, please. I'm... No, you, you could, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think to your point, I don't know if I needed uh, a, a credential behind my name for those things. And the reason right. why I say that is because like, so one of those kids uh, is a kid named Marvin Cordova, who I still mentor to this day. He's like a little brother, but he ended up going to the United States Army. It, I mentored him for a very long time. I still mentor him. We send him care packages. He went to the United States Army and literally is following in my footsteps at this very moment. Um, and thinking about college and what the next step looks like. And so that's the check mark right there is seeing the product of that work um, and how much of an impact it's making. Um, and so, you know, that that work in New York was about how do I use this space that I'm in? That's remarkably amazing. NYU School of Medicine is beautiful. Um, but it's also, um, it's ivory. It's like a pristine place. So for those kids, it's like, when will I ever even get the permission to be here? Like who will ever allow me to just walk up in here? So it was really a game changer for us to be like, yo, listen, y'all could come here. Y'all could come to the labs here. You can learn here. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that was priceless to your point, because for those kids, it was game changing. A lot of those kids mm -hmm. ended up going to like Johns Hopkins and and a whole bunch of other really good institutions. And some of them, you know, finished up or some of them actually just graduated a few uh, a few weeks ago and they're off doing amazing things. And I know that we played a huge role in that. And that's all that really matters is that we played a huge role. And, and I applaud you for that, and I thank you for that, and, and those those kids, now adults, um, are, are going to help spread that even further. Yep. Um, 
So again, I, I, there's so much to cover. I, I don't want to step t away from NYU too fast, but we kind of have to because mm -hmm. I want to hear the story of uh, Russell O'Day, security guard uh, at Baton Rouge Medical Center, asking a doctor as you walk him to his car at night, could you shadow him? To, uh, share that whole story, please. Yeah. So um, when I got off of active duty, um, that was 2009. I, I switched over to the United States Navy Reserves, doing the exact same job in cryptology intelligence. Um, and I needed to get a job because I don't have that active duty paycheck anymore. We moved to Baton Rouge because I was going to Southern University for undergrad. So I applied for this job as a security guard at this hospital. And I immediately got the job and I took the job and I didn't have any intentions of becoming a physician. Um, I was going to become a social worker, but I think I just got bit by the bug of seeing white coats just walking around the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, and things of that nature. And, and you see trauma happening in the emergency room and you're like, wow, look at these doctors, like remarkably, you know, helping people. And I was like, wow, maybe I could do this for a living. Um, so I started asking a lot of doctors, like, you know, you, you see them on the ramp, you see them in the hospital, wherever. I'm like, hey, can I shadow you? Like, I'm interested in becoming a doctor. And they're like, nah, man, security guards don't become doctors. Mm. Security guards don't become doctors. Um, security guards don't become doctors. You know, they actually were right. Security guard doc Security guards don't become doctors. They become double doctors. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but but to that point, man, that that this one guy, he was looking for help to get to the emergency. I mean, to the operating room. He wasn't very familiar with the hospital, um, but I think he was on call and. He needed help to get to the operating room. So I helped him. I, I, I escorted him there. And then when I saw him leaving, he came back through the emergency room. And I was like, here's my chance. Like, I'm going to ask. And, you know, I just I just kept asking. I was like, I might as well just keep on asking because I don't take no for an answer. So I asked him. I was like, hey, man, are you really a surgeon? And he was like, yeah. I was like, whoa. Like, do you think I can shadow you? And he was like, yeah, I don't see why not. Like, and I was wow. like, bro, what? Like, hold on. You know, <laughs> I was like, I can see why not. I I've heard a lot of people tell me why not. <laughs> um, you know, but he was like, nah, man, meet me here in the morning. So I actually stayed at the hospital overnight and um, I met him um, that next morning. He got all the paperwork done. I was in the OR with him. I went to go see some patients with him. And I was like, oh, I want to do this for a living. Like I want to become a doctor, um, which I had no clue what I was getting myself into at the time. <laughs> um, I had absolutely no idea. Um, so I ended up doing that, man. And then, crazy enough, medical school happens 2018 and 2022. And in my third year of medical school, summer of 2020, summer of 2021 or 2020, I can't remember. Um, you do these things called rotations while you're in medical school. Mm -hmm. And my first rotation was in surgery. It was in vascular surgery. And they there's a system where it's random. Like they they randomly pick where you can go to do your to do your uh your rotation. And it just so happened that they selected uh Baton Rouge General Hospital for where I needed to go. And I was like, there's no way this is real. Like, this can't be like a real thing. So I get there and sure enough, exact same hospital. So before I went in, I, I think I was up all morning crying. Like it was tears of joy. It was like, I cannot believe this. Um, and that morning I recorded, you know, just my feelings and just some some moments of inspiration for everyone who's ever doubted the idea that you can get to where you want to be. Um, and I posted it to Facebook because I'm like, that. I know it's going to go viral. I just was like, hey, this is this is some good. You know, this I think this is something good people should hear. And, and um, so one of my mentors who uh, works for Vogue magazine reached out to me and was like, hey, I think we need to interview you because this is remarkable. And she I think she started a wildfire because then, you know, uh, 
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt called and then Good Morning America and it all went up from the from there. So And now you've come all the way to the What's the Point podcast. So yeah. who who would have who would have thunk? Hey. <laughs> hey. Look at look at life. <laughs> um so you talked about your rotations and, and I'll get to this in a minute, but I just want to mention it so that I don't forget. And that is um, you are in the process of having two weeks off before you relocate to, to start your residency. And if I'm not mistaken, you're looking to get a triple board residency. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to park that just for a minute because <laughs> uh, there, there's something even, I think, um, at, at least equally significant. Those of you watching this on YouTube will see that RJ has on a shirt is saying that resilience is in our DNA. And that's a quote attributed to uh, from the 15 white coats. Mm -hmm. Now, the 15 white coats, speaking of going viral, <laughs> is a photograph that you uh, a visit that you had arranged and a photograph that you had taken and built a, a bit of a movement from. Uh, while still in medical school at the Whitney Plantation. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us that story. Yeah, so July of 2019, um, my daughter had, um, I had invited her to go to the Whitney Plantation. Myself, along with one of my close friends, Phil Thomas, um, and her, my, my, my buddy had come down to visit me from New York. He was still getting his PhD and he came down and he was like, hey, let's go to the Whitney Plantation. So we went. And I strung on my daughter into going. I was like, you need to go. It's some, it's some history. You need to go see it. So um, she went, she saw it, she, you know, she she enjoyed it. And then when we left, um, she said, Daddy. And I was like, what's up, Malia? She was like, now I finally understand why it's such a big deal to be a black doctor in America. I was like, wow, yeah, I've been trying to tell you that for forever. Um, but she, she, you know, she, obviously she's a kid, so it didn't make sense to her at the time. But and the next thing she told me that was really shocking was, I was like, why'd you say that? And she said, uh, because we just left a plantation where there was a time when, um, people who look like you and Uncle Phil weren't able to read or write or anything. Like they would have been killed for doing those things. And now I'm riding in the car with two black doctors. She's like, we've come a long way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to that point, I looked at Phil and said, man, I got an idea. I think we can illustrate to the world how far we've come. Um, in spite of some systems that are, are clearly not working in our favor. Um, and so when I got back, I reached out to some really close friends, Sidney Labatt, Rachel Turner, Carrie Crook, a few others. Um, and I told him about it. I was like, hey, like, I got this idea. I want to, you know, curate this photo of us in our white coats um, in all black in front of this slave cabin um, to illustrate to the world just how far we've come. And we did that. And those photos took the Internet by storm. Like, it was insane. And so we decided to take that clout that comes with, you know, being viral and turn it into a nonprofit. Because we realized that the, the challenge to becoming a physician really comes from um, not have like you, you have to have a certain amount of money um, to become a physician or you got to be really lucky to get enough scholarships. But people don't even know how much it costs to apply to medical school. It can cost upwards of five to ten thousand dollars to apply to medical school. Wow. So if you don't just have that money laying around or a family member just have that money laying around, you're kind of stuck. Like, and it doesn't matter how much you want to become a physician, if you don't have the money to do it, you just can't do it. Um, and so that's essentially what the nonprofit does now. We create scholarships. Um, based on need, you know, right now we're running one for historically black college and university medical school applicants to pay for their application process. So you have to pay for the application to be submitted through the um, uh, American Medical College admissions service or application service platform. And that can cost almost a thousand dollars. So we're taking care of 20 
HBCU students who are applying to medical school right now. Um, and that's, that's amazing because I think at the end of the day, if we can get 50% of those people to actually get into medical school, we're putting a dent into it. You know, we're, we're, we're making some progress. Um, and so that's, that's the work that we're doing. And it's really impactful, man. And obviously we put the photo in classrooms for free. So any school or any learning space can go on the 15whitecoast.org um, website and sign up for a poster for free. And we just mail it to them. So a portion of our you know proceeds goes towards those photos being put in classrooms. It's a big poster, a two foot by three foot poster. Um, and then the, the rest of it goes to scholarships. And that's that's essentially our bread and butter. Well, it's, it's a powerful photograph and, and even more powerful that the, the, the impact that's come from it. So 15whitecoats.org and that's 15 the numerical 15whitecoats.org. It'll be in the show notes, but but I encourage everyone to to take a look and uh, maybe uh, maybe help support that that organization. The picture itself is so powerful because it's 15 black medical students, doctors, an array of people in the in the medical field mm -hmm. standing in front of what had been slave quarters on the Whitney plantation. Yep. And it really, really resonates. It's, it's no surprise at all why it went viral. And I was thinking of that, RJ, when earlier you said that as a security guard, uh, you were looking around seeing people with white coats going all over the place. And I was thinking that you probably didn't see anything other than white coats and white yep. skin. Yep. Uh, and and uh, for you to be able to say, hey, I want in and I deserve to be in and I'm going to get in uh, it is is powerful. And that's that's part of the reason that you to me, uh, it, it, if. If we could only use pictures in a dictionary, I would put your picture next to a lot of words, but in, in particular, I would put resilience and I would put determination uh, and, and relative to this podcast purpose uh, yeah. with your picture next to it. So uh, it, it's it's impressive that you thought of that and pulled it off the way you did. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. No, I think it's uh, not just for the lives you're going to touch individually, but I think for the collective uh, benefit of society as we expand and grow. And much like you said, sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit here. <laughs> much like you said that there's always the opportunity to learn different ways to enhance what we have and to grow from other countries, other cultures. It's the same thing uh, with with people. I mean, yeah. who would have thought that I'd be talking to to you with with your accomplishments? Uh, and and learning so much from you after my long life. It, it, it's incredible <laughs> what you've done and the lives that you're going to touch. You know, I hope so, man. I, I think, uh, I hope not only is my story inspiring, but it's moving. I hope it moves people to do more. Um, I hope it yeah. moves people to go after whatever it is you think you can accomplish in life. Because you can't. You literally can't. Um, as crazy as that sounds, you really can. Um, it's just a matter of surrounding yourself with the right people, making sure that you're diligent, um, not taking no for an answer. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of no's. Everything you try to do, you're going to get some no's. I'm sure you know this, Bill. You've been living longer than me. You're going to get some no's. Um, yeah. You know, but I, I think I said this in that Fox 8 thing. Your no can't be my no. Like, that's that's your no. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to own your no, uh, I'm just going to let you have that no, And then I'll figure out where the yes is just clearly the yes is not through you. Um, uh, but eventually I'll find the yes. Cause the yes exists. It's just a matter of where it exists. Um, and me searching hard enough to find it. So I always think of every endeavor I go through, like trying to find the keys in the house after you've lost them. Um, yeah. <laughs> to what lengths are you willing to go to find the keys? whatever it takes, because you need the keys in order to drive the car. Great analogy. I love that. And, and I'm going to use it. And I might even give you credit for it when I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the thing about no's is um, 
none of us tend to like rejection. And so we can look at, uh, I've learned, and, and I'm still learning this, that we can look at a no as a rejection, or we can look at it as a step forward mm -hmm. in getting those no's out of the way to clear the path to the yeses that, that we're looking for. So yeah, I, I love the, the car key analogy. So you're moving on to residency, and, and mm -hmm. uh, that's in a week or two, so you have very little time to, to pack up wife and, and daughters, and uh, wife Mallory and Malia and Melina. Is, is yep. did, what are your yep. daughters? Okay. Yep. Uh, and, and are they excited? Uh, how old are they yeah. now? Yeah, so one's four, that's Melina, um, and one's 11, that's Malia. Um, and we actually already okay. moved to Indiana, man. We moved to Indiana this weekend. Um, we knocked oh, okay. out. So, so yeah. the, the physical move's done. Yeah, yeah. We literally physically finished it. I'm sitting in my office now, which is still a little empty, but it'll be full soon enough. And um, yeah, I'm sitting at my new desk and we we are in our new home. Uh, we, we, we did all that work in the past, like three or four days with the help of some amazing uh, friends and family. Um, Elliot and Cody and Bella and Angel, um, my father-in-law. Man, you know, I, I have to say this, Bill. When I graduated from medical school, it dawned on me just how amazing the group of people, like that vault of people around me and my wife have been and just the level of care they had. Jason and Shakitra, just the people who are around us to make sure that we're okay and that we're well taken care of to get to this next point. And I think that's important, especially for your listeners to understand, you know, if you have some purpose in life that you're trying to accomplish, make sure that you vet the people around you, like vet them, you know, make sure that they're the people who are interested in you making it to your destination and also you're willing to help them make it to their destination. Um, but people who are really, really, really invested in you. Um, that's critically important because it's hard to accomplish your purpose without that. It's incredibly difficult. I couldn't imagine mm -hmm. getting here without the help of those people. Um, and that's why we've been so successful. We literally did this entire move in three days. From New Orleans, Louisiana to here in three days. With a 26 foot, crazy. A 26 foot Penske truck through the mountains. Literally in three days, we did it. <laughs> Um, house is fully set up. Um, I can't think. I can't think. Those folks I, I called out earlier enough. Um, it's it literally impossible without them. But with them, it's all done. It's like literally done. It's done. Everything we're doing now is extra. Well, speaking of extra, thank you for for allowing me to be part of your extra. So, uh, uh, some quick insight for the listeners. Um, I, I was made aware of RJ's story through an article that my brother sent me from a New Orleans television station. Um, and I reached out to him through LinkedIn and <laughs> surprised me, frankly, to get a response right away. Uh, and he said, I'd love to be on your podcast. Thank you for thinking of me. And we set up a time and then he sent me a message and he said, you know, moving is a little bit more involved than I thought. Um, can we reschedule? And I said, of course, absolutely. Just let me know when your schedule clears up. Uh, that was three days ago. <laughs> so when he says that time is a non-refundable resource and do what you can when you can, he doesn't play. No. You know? he, no. he lives that and he means it. So thank you and thank your entire team, your entire village for making that happen. And, and for you giving uh, me and our and the listeners the gift of your time and knowledge and and uh, and that smile again you need to get on YouTube just to see this smile <laughs> this man has. It's it's pretty powerful. Um so, so what's next? A, a triple board uh, residency is, 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 is you, you never you never just take the simple route, do you? No, nah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think uh, the most special thing about being a triple board resident for me personally is I get to be all the things I wanted to have when I was a child, like. I wanted to have like a readily accessible pediatrician. I wanted to have somebody to address mental health when I was a child. Like these are things that, you know, when I was in high school, I was like, man, bro, like the world is swirling. You know, things are things. It seems like things are just moving and I'm trying to figure it all out. 
but I don't know if we had access to mental health services. Like we definitely didn't have a black male child psychiatrist to just go tap on. We did not have that. So I'm getting to become those things, man. I'm starting residency in two weeks here in, in Indianapolis um, at, at Indiana University. And I'm living out a dream, man. I'm literally living out a dream. And I could not have, I could not be more grateful. Um, yeah, I always take the hard route. I think I always take the hard route because I want to accomplish hard things. Um, and I think in order to accomplish hard things, you have to take the hard route. Hard route is rarely travel. So that's, I think that's part of why my story is so remarkable is because it's a really challenging route. It's an extremely challenging route. And so, and it's rarely done. So it's a, it's a story worth being told. And, and I think it's going to inspire generations from now on. Like there are a lot of kids who will be changed by hearing my story in the future. Well, I agree with you 100%. I'll also tell you that there's a lot of adults that are going to be inspired by your story. And you're speaking with one right now. Um, and, and another is my brother who thought to send me that, uh, that TV interview. Um, I, I think it's really important just to, again, reiterate one of the points you made that, yes, you always take the hard route. You always want to accomplish. And, and a lot of people that do that keep the focus on themselves. You know, yes, I'm in the spotlight. I've done this. Me, 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 me. Uh, but what you've done is acknowledged all along the way, the help that you've mm -hmm. received, the hand that's been given, not to, not to, uh, uh, I mean, the hand is just to help you in your climb. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it wasn't a hand giving you stuff. It was yep. a hand assisting you. And you just, you just listed a bunch of names of people in, in your, in your village, in your support group, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's as powerful as anything. We need to both seek those types of people, but also acknowledge and appreciate yep. those type of people, you know, the, the background people. So I applaud you for that. And I thank you for that, because I think that's as, as powerful an example of anything that we've talked about today. Yep. Uh, the realization that, yeah, it, it's you're the engine, but but there's a lot of parts to the car that's getting you there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's been, you know, people ask me, uh, like, what was my secret to success? And I was like, man, God somehow just decided to put the right people around me. You know, because I think this whole journey is impossible without, um, you know, those people, my mom and dad, my mother-in-law, father-in-law. I didn't know I'd be that close to them. You know, I didn't know, I had no idea that like I could rely on them for advice and like how to make the next decision, where to go, what to do. Um, you know, my mom sends me encouraging messages from time to time. You know, my dad telling me, hey, I'm proud of you. Go do what you need to do. My brothers looking, my, my younger brothers, I didn't know my younger sisters. I didn't know that I'd be inspiring to them. And so I think I just purposely make sure that at every opportunity, every turn that I get, I try to give as many flowers as I can. Um, because I think to your point, oftentimes when you hit the spotlight, you just want to bask in the spotlight. You don't, you, cause you feel like, oh, if I give somebody else credit, then it doesn't, it's not as cool. Cause I, I, I didn't do it on my own. In all honesty, I have yet to see too many people accomplish this level of success without having a bunch of people to help them. It's literally impossible. You can't do it on your own. You need people to help you and people want to help you. The people that don't realize that and aren't willing to accept that are the people that don't achieve the level yep. of success that you're talking about or anything close to it. Yep. So again, in, in deference to your time, I, I want to respect uh, the amount of time that, that uh, we had talked about. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and your commitment. But you know the, the name of this podcast is What's the Point? And, and that, that's a question that I always say can't be asked often enough. Um, you know, well, what's the point? I want to be a doctor. Or what's the point? And it goes deeper and deeper. And, and what's the point can also be one of defeatism. Uh, but with you, that's certainly not the case. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can't leave the show without asking you, in, in, in the scheme of your world and your life and your journey, what's the point? What's the point for RJ? I think the point for me is to be the impact in my community 
that's never been there before. Like in a way that's never been there before. Um, in a light with a certain amount of influence that's never been there before. Um, and do something new. Um, do something new. Ingenuity and creativity and innovation is going to take us much further than repeating what's been done already. And so I'm going to do something new. My journey is new. Um, the way I'm approaching telling my journey is, is new. The way I'm going to be a physician is going to be something new. Um, and I just want my community to have all the things I wish I had when I was a kid. The access to the health care, the access to good food stores, the access to economic stability, the access to good air quality, the access to money, like the access to good, good mental health services. So I'm going to bear the brunt of that and make sure that it gets done. So powerful. And again, RJ, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your story. Thank you for the for the part of your journey that we've yet to see unfold. But as it unfolds, uh, you'll be touching lives and, and helping in, in ways that none of us can really imagine at this point. So uh, my, my, my love for your journey and for you and, and for what you're doing it has just grown incredibly during this last uh, almost hour. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just wish you the very best. Um, I, I thank you for your time and, and, and people, if you want to connect with, uh, with, uh, Dr. Russell J. Lede, that's L E D E T, um, a little Louisiana saying there, um, <laughs> You know, the, the information for LinkedIn and the information for 15whitecoats.org will be in the show notes. Um, Dr. Lede, thank you for your journey. Thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, it, it's been incredible. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We can promise you'll gain value in every one. Rating and reviewing makes us more discoverable and helps others find out what's the point. And if you'd like to know more about Bill Ellis or contact him, please visit his website, www.brandingpillars.com. See you next time.